Microsoft beat earnings. The stock is up. We will translate all of this for you, Paul. Give me the info. So Microsoft beat earnings by three cents per share. They beat revenue by $300 million. Now, the interesting part about all this is three cents a share on $2.20. It's a little over one and a half percent, a little less than one and a half percent. And the revenue on $49.3 billion, they beat by $300 million. What is that? That is... 0.6%, but the, the stock is up a lot. Now, this is where I don't, I get confused mm -hmm. because I look at this saying, okay, this is a big company with a very lofty price that's gone up a lot, which could very well be justified. This is what I want to encourage people to do is make sure you understand that beating by a little bit is great. I'd rather have them beat than not beat, but your job is to understand, is it worth the jump of what is the stock up right now? Let's go to our software. Let's pull up Microsoft. And the stock currently is up 1.8%. So it's pulled back a little bit, I think, than earlier. Because I think it was up 3 or 4% earlier. So listen, I love Microsoft. They're a cash cow. My job here is, and you're probably watching this video, is to say, okay, well, can the stock justify the price? And that's the best question to ask. That's what we're trying to answer for every single investment out there. That, hey, things are looking good but is this the right price to pay for the stock? And that's how we have our software. Let's go through our eight pillar process to understand Microsoft stock. Now, one thing I want you to know though, look at this, the stock was actually at 350 just, just six, seven months ago, mm -hmm. right? And it hit a low of 238 earlier last year, but now it's at about their recent low since going to their high. So why is it down 20%? I don't know, but let's find out. So first off, Microsoft's a $2.2 .2 trillion market cap. We want the five-year price to earnings ratio to be under 22.5. It is currently 50. So well over double. Big X. Now, does that mean we're not buying? No. Don't just focus on PE. PE is a part of the story. If the company can grow 20, 30, 40% a year for the next 10 years, I would gladly pay that number. So hold off for a second. Mm -hmm. Pillar number two, we want the five-year return on invested capital being greater than 9%. It is 17.4, almost double. And software companies tend to have a very high return on capital. It means they make a good return on the money that's invested in the business. Pillar number three, we want revenue growth to be positive in the last five years. So we go to the income statement on our software. We go back five years, 96.5 to 168. Massive check mark there. Someone in our community wants my attention. It's me, Paul. Keep going. Okay. <laughs> it was it you? No, no, I was joking. All right, pillar number four, we want the profit or the net income from Microsoft the last five years to be positive. So we go back, we scroll down a little bit to the net income line. Five years ago is 25.5, last year 61. Massive check mark, well over double. So revenue is not even up double, but the profit's two and a half times more, which is great. Mm -hmm. Pillar number five, Shares outstanding. Seth, please talk to me about shares outstanding. Yeah, I know so, this is something that blew your mind when we first started talking about absolutely. it. Absolutely. When you do the math, it's even crazier. So the concept of, you know, Paul, I used to see all these stocks as just, and you might be doing this too at home. I used to see these stocks as just a ticker symbol. My price to believe ratio had to be pretty <laughs> high because I simply bought a number and hope it went up. And this is one of the factors that if you are a co-owner of this business and they issue more shares, they're taking on more owners and your profits are getting split. Hopefully we want the company Companies that we buy to be buying back shares. Or at least us, keeping them the same. Oh yeah, giving us a, a higher percentage of the company. So let's see what they're doing. So five years ago, the end of the sixth year, they had 7.93 billion. Now they have 7.55. So they are buying back shares. So at least you're not taking on more owners to split your profits with. Mm -hmm. That's the good news. Pillar number six. Now pillar number six has to do with debt. We go back to this main page. And one of the factors I look at guys is the five-year average free cash flow. I take that 43.4 billion, I multiply it by that by five. That gives me a hundred, that gives me $219 billion. I want their long-term liabilities to be under 219 billion. That's their long-term debt because companies that have lower debt will stay around longer when times are tough. I know we haven't seen tough times in a while, but they will occur. That's what happens. So what do I do? I very simply go to the balance sheet on our software, I scroll to the very bottom, and our most recent long-term liabilities, 103 billion. <laughs> they can pay off their long-term liabilities in under two and a half years. So this is a very safe company from that standpoint based on what we see today. Pillars number seven and eight are our final pillars that have to do with cash flow. So we go to the cash flow statement and guys, free cash flow is a true lifeblood of the business. It's cash from operations, less your capital expenditures. Mm -hmm. You can do one of five things. You can pay down debt, you can buy back shares, invest in yourself, make acquisition, or pay dividends. Okay, you can do those five things with free cash flow. 
We added this line here to make it easy for you because this does not exist in a regular cash flow statement. Five years ago, they did 31.4. Last year, 56. Check mark there. So they definitely have increased their free cash flow. The final pillar, we want to take that price to free cash flow and apply it like an earnings ratio. We multiply this by 20 to get some sort of market cap we want to pay for the company. $830 billion versus the $2.16 trillion. So according to this, it's an X, it's overpriced. But we'll get to that because it's not necessarily overpriced. Now, guys, all that math was confusing. If you're like me, you're lazy and you want to just have something do it for you. So I created the software. It does it for me. So here are the eight pillars right here. Yeah, I don't want to do that math. It's yeah, the math is terrible. I love math and I don't even want to do it. Cool. I just want to have it regurgitated to me. So this is what we love, guys. Companies that have six checks, these six checks and those two Xs. These two Xs are the valuation at, um, Xs. We're just waiting for the stock to come to a lower price. From here right now, all the fundamentals in love. I don't know if you love the company. I love Microsoft, the company. They're growing revenue. They're growing profit. They're growing cash flow. They have low debt. Everything we could possibly imagine we want in a company, they have. So now the question is, what do we pay for the stock price? Assuming that uh, the Activision Blizzard deal goes through, this is huge for them. What is huge for them? The Activision Blizzard deal? Yeah, like uh, setting aside that much free cash to acquire a company. What can it do? This is really churning up a lot of excitement. I mean, yeah, well, because Xbox, you know, there's gonna be a lot of competition in the gaming world, right? And PlayStation does well, Xbox does, uh, Xbox does well, but this gives them the ability to own a certain market of gaming and add that revenue structure to it. So let's go to our stock analyzer tool. Guys, every investment's the present value of all future cash flow. If you watch more than five videos from us, that will be ingrained in your head, Yeah. right? Because whenever you outlay money for an investment, you want to know how much you, how you can get paid along the way, okay? This does that for you. You can do one to 20 year analysis. I always pick 10. Now, the first thing we do is revenue growth. So my goal is to make conservative assumptions and they might be more conservative than yours, but my goal is to make conservative assumptions and buy the company when it hits those conservative assumption prices, okay? These assumptions need to be uh, smaller than most because things really bad could happen, like a not war, only that, a recession, correct. supply chain issues, all of this could occur. But not only that, it's harder for a larger company to grow like it did in the past. Mm -hmm. So that's why we put the one, five, and 10-year numbers here. So here are my assumptions for revenue growth. I'm going to go four, seven, and 10%. Profit margin, I'm going to do 25, 28, and 31. Free cash flow margin, I'm going to do 29, 28, 30, and 32. PE, Guys, it's a big company. The bigger the company, the smaller the growth level, the lower the PE needs to be. And the same with the price to free cash flow. And then finally, at the very last line, I put, what's my desired annual return? Well, I want a 12.5% return on my investment. Why? Because I can invest in an ETF and get 9 or 10%. So to put a margin of safety and to give myself a reason to buy a stock, I, an individual stock, I don't make more than the market. Give me a reason to do the work, right? So I put 12.5% in. If you're following along at home, this is your tool. We created this for the people in our community. You can put in whatever assumptions you like. If this is too careful for you, you can go a little riskier. But regardless, we're going to give you what you should be paying for this stock to get this said return. Paul, yep. go ahead. So with the analyze button, and it just says it's overpriced right now, but that's okay. I'm going to sit here and be patient. The low is 70 to 75 to 90. The high is 170, 175. And the middle is about 115 to 120. Now, personally... I remember looking at the stock and I, don't, I didn't like the middle number. I think it's a little bit higher than that middle number. But the good news is with the software, when it does hit my level that I want, let's say I want it to hit 170, I add it to my watch list and notify me when it hits, when it goes below there, boom. And now I have it on my watch list. And when it hits the price target, it'll notify me and I can go and make another determination. Because by then, maybe fundamentals have gotten better on Microsoft. Maybe my assumptions here have been proven, no, Paul, it's, or maybe it's gotten worse and my price will go lower. The point is, these are the tools you need to make a determination for yourself what price to pay. And my determination is different than yours. Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger always talk about if they both value Berkshire Hathaway, they both come up with different values for it because everybody's assumptions are different. So for Microsoft, as of right now, I'm going to wait for it to hit my 170 price target and then I'll take a further look at it.